Here we are on a beautiful Thursday afternoon in North Seattle in a quiet, peaceful neighborhood called Wedgwood, just a little bit south of Eckstein Middle School on Northeast 75th Street. And one would never know, standing here in this peaceful, quiet neighborhood, that perhaps 10 meters, 20 feet away from me, sits one of Seattle's true geological, natural, historic wonders. You can drive by here 50 times and not see it. You can take a bus on Northeast 75th Street. You could attend Eckstein Middle School for three years and never know that this geological wonder, this gem, is here in Seattle. It's going to tell us a story. It's a spectacular story to learn. And we'll spend the next 10 minutes or so learning from a giant rock. If you look to my left, Behind those trees, you will see something perhaps that you could walk by or drive by day after day and not see until you know what it is and how it formed and where it came from. All right, I'm walking around the Wedgwood Rock and it is 80 feet around. It's 19 feet high and it weighs roughly one and a half million pounds. Every rock has a story to tell us. And geologists, when they come upon a rock for the very first time, they begin to ask questions of that rock. And the words that we use to interpret the history of that rock come from the structures we see, the fossils we see, the minerals we see, the features within the rocks that we can see, and we then pose a series of questions when we want to try to interpret the geological history of the area. When I come up to the Wedgwood Rock, I immediately ask myself, what are you? And how did you form? And perhaps where did you come from? How old are you? How did you get to this particular place? And once you arrived here, has anything happened to you since you arrived here? There's just a series of questions that's almost like an interview in a newspaper where you would come up to a subject, but the rock, quiet and mute, can't answer us. We can only ask questions and make observations, and those are the places from which we get the answers. The amazing thing is that there's no sign when we go to a national park, there's always an explanation of the amazing things we see there. This rock just sits here with no identification. It's a silent sentinel of a story that very few people know. The Wedgwood Rock is a glacial erratic, which is a term that geologists use to describe a very large rock, which clearly it is, that has come from someplace else, carried by a glacier, and then dropped in a place that is absolutely unrelated geologically to the rock type that you're dealing with. So this rock is made up of a certain type of rock that just doesn't appear in the city of Seattle. The glaciers that came here did so perhaps 15 to 20,000 years ago. So let me whisk you back in time to think about what Seattle was like 20,000 years ago, 18,000 years ago. Where I am standing at this spot in North Seattle, the ice above me would have been 3,000 feet thick. So that's three-fifths of a mile straight up from where I'm standing, there would have been an ice sheet. I can hear you thinking, how do we know the elevation of the ice? How thick the ice was over Seattle? The way we do this is we look actually up on the slopes of the Olympics, where we find giant boulders of granite up at elevations of 3,000 to 5,000 feet, right up on the slope. And the only way that they could have gotten there was by glaciers, because the rocks of the Olympics are not granite. And that ice sheet had incredible power, the power to carry virtually anything of any size that it chose. So the glacier that came here came from British Columbia. It's a gift from Canada, and it originated between Vancouver Island and the city of Vancouver in what is referred to as the Straits of Georgia. 
Straits of Georgia at their widest, somewhere around 35 miles wide, narrowest maybe 12 miles wide, and about 150 miles long. And it's an ancient river valley, now filled with water, where ice flowed in and accumulated to great thicknesses. In Seattle, the ice was 3,000 feet thick. In Bellingham, about an hour north of Seattle, the ice was a mile thick. And the ice gets thinner and thinner as you get towards its margin, towards its terminus, where it stops. So in Tacoma, the ice was about, about 1,500 feet thick. And the ice stopped, got stuck on some high hills, about 10 miles south of Olympia in the beautiful town of Tenaino. So the ice that came here from British Columbia left behind a geological record, the glacial story. And it's virtually a textbook of some of the most amazing erosional features and depositional features that a glacier is capable of producing. Here in this area, it laid down a layer of what is referred to as glacial till, and that's the soil in which all of our vegetables, all of our flowers, all of our beautiful lush greenery grows in this glacial till. So that's a gift from the glaciers leaving us behind this particular material. The glaciers also reshaped all of the hills of this area, changed them from round irregular shape to very streamlined elongated shapes. And you can see those all around Seattle, Seattle's hills, on Bainbridge Island, Queen Anne Hill itself is a feature that we refer to as a drumlin. A drumlin is a Scottish word, comes from the highlands of Scotland, where glaciers did the same thing they did as they did in Seattle and overran hills and streamlined them. So many of Seattle hills have this streamlined nature where the north side of the hill is steeper and the south side of the hill is gentler. The glacier kind of went up the back side of a, of a hill, streamed out the feature so that basically we could tell the direction that the glacier came from, always steeper on the side that the glacier advanced from. The glacier also left behind, as I said, this till layer, and till layers are made out of the tiniest little sand grains and clay particles, but also rocks as big as your fist, rocks as big as a Subaru, and rocks as big as a small house because glaciers are so powerful in their ability to transport that they really don't care very much about the size of the things that they pick up and carry. And we discover that this rock is something that's referred to as a greenstone, which is a metamorphic version of the typical ocean floor rock basalt. So immediately we say to ourselves, that probably formed at the bottom of an ocean. We don't know which ocean it was. And then it got heated and pressed to turn into something called the greenstone because it is a metamorphic rock, a rock that's been heated and pressed and changed, usually in the process of a building of mountains. Here I'm going to point to, down here with my little pointer here, an area of very greenish rock, which is how we get the name greenstone. And it gets its color principally from two minerals, one called chlorite which is very much rich in iron and magnesium, and another one that we call epidote, which is rich in calcium and aluminum. And both of those impart a greenish cast to this rock, and thus the name greenstone. This particular greenstone, we believe, although it's not positive, comes from Fidalgo Island in the San Juans. So there is a place called Mount Erie, right near the tulip fields in the Skagit Valley, mountain sitting above the tulip fields and you can see it and the glacier that came from that region plucked a massive block of that rock transported it 90 kilometers or 55 miles to this place in North Seattle. The origin of that rock at Mount Erie has its own story to tell and that story is the story of long distance travel of great bodies of rock, rocks that perhaps formed a thousand, five thousand, ten thousand miles away. Thus, 100 million years ago, a great collision between an ancient ocean, no longer here, and North America, the western edge, produced heating and pressing and mountain building and so 
scraped off part of the sea floor to produce our North Cascade Mountains until geological uplift, erosion, exposed this rock at the Earth's surface in the form of Mount Erie. And then, somewhere around 20,000 years ago, the massive Puget Sound glacier scraped and plucked at the edge of Mount Erie, picked up this block of rock and deposited it 55 miles south here in North Seattle. It began on the sea floor hundreds of millions of years ago as volcanic islands. It traveled here thousands of miles until ultimately it collided with North America. When it did so, it was heated. It was pressed. It became mountains. It turned green. And ultimately, it was exposed at the Earth's surface and sat quietly for tens of millions of years. Until such time that our gift from Canada, the Puget Sound Glacial Lobe, picked up and plucked a piece of rock from Mount Erie, transported it 55 miles to North Seattle, and about 14,000 years ago, when the glaciers finally melted away, this was left behind. There lies the fascinating story of our Wedgwood Rock. And we have to take a pause to realize how very fortunate we are if we know how to ask the questions, know how to find the rocks that we want to look at around our region, that Seattle has had an incredibly dynamic geological history.